Hi, and welcome to the discussion and implications um, segment for assessment is constructed and contextual. I'll be sharing key findings and what we see as some of the significant implications of our study. And um, our key takeaways uh, that you heard somewhat about in the previous section, students who self-identify as marginalized are better at critically assessing information than students who do not. Interviews um, can be sites of meaning making and interviews offer opportunities for asset based anti racist assessment and to explore these takeaways I'll be um, sharing some interpretive frames that we use to um, analyze our results and I'll go into those first. These interpretive frames include asset based approaches and funds of knowledge contact zones and autoethnography, and then interviews as meaning making. So asset-based approaches uh, resist focusing on deficits of learners, particularly underrepresented and marginalized learners. Beginning in the 1990s, research findings began to recognize the prevalence of deficit theorizing in education. Deficit theorizing blames the underachievement of ethnic minority groups in schools on perceived deficiencies related to minority students themselves and their, fam their families and their cultures, um, as quoted by Hogg, 2011. Since that time, more attention has been given to asset-based approaches, which recognize the strength and capacities afforded by diverse uh, cultural and community experiences. One set such asset-based frame is um, funds of knowledge. And funds of knowledge is defined um, by Mole et al. as the historically accumulated and culturally developed bodies of knowledge and skills essential for household and individual functioning and well-being. And the authors go on to argue that funds of knowledge is a way to integrate real-world knowledge into pedagogy. The second interpretive frame is contact zones and autoethnography, um, coined by Mary Louise Pratt in 1991. And uh, this appears um, fairly frequently in the light critical uh, information literacy literature. So you may be familiar with this. Um, but contact zones are defined as social spaces where cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in context of a highly acid asymmetrical relations to power. And Pratt argues for recognizing and engaging with these contact zones uh, within the classroom as a form of critical practice. And she goes on to describe what she terms the arts of the contact zone, which are largely conceived of as oppositional discourse that students engage in when confronted with these contact zones. And one such art is autoethnography. And Pratt defines autoethnographic texts as a text in which people undertake to describe themselves in ways that engage in representations others have made of them. Within this, Pratt describes transculturation, which is a process why, whereby members of subordinated or marginal groups select and invent from materials uh, transmitted by dominant or metro metropolitan cultures. And I'll connect these, um, oh, sorry, uh, one more uh, interpretive frame, which is interviews as meaning making. Hiller and Deluzio um, situate interviews as a generative meaning making activity for interviewees and see interviews as sites of active collaboration between the interviewee and the interviewer um, and um, capable of producing knowledge. And um, in our work, we focus on how this is possible for researcher, researchers, researchers and interviewers, as well as the interviewee. Um, and conversations uh, reveal things that neither party um, would have known about without this um, collaborative dialogue. So I'll um, uh, pull in the threads of these interpretive frames um, in walking through our key findings. So the first key finding um, that students who self-identify as marginalized are um, better at critically assessing information than students who do not. 
and um, findings suggest that experiences of marginalization may serve as an asset to students in assessing information, which may be related to funds of knowledge that students bring to their academic work. And by way of example, this quote from a student essay demonstrates a number of the trust indicators that we um, were um, analyzing in our essays and interview um, transcripts. So you can see in this quote, there is an analysis of sources used in the pieces referenced um, in the discussion of the use of statistics, student surveys, interviews of students. There's also a critique of the sources used, um, particularly, particularly related to the um, lack of student voice um, or the need for additional student voice. The student also addresses the positionality or expertise of authors and critiques that as well. Um, so the written by adults for adults um, is, is a critique of um, giving uh, deference to adult voice over student voice. Um, and then the valuing of local voices and the lack of diverse voices is also encapsulated in this clip, um, specifically in calls for more student voice to be included in these types of stories. And then finally, the student um, accurately um, contextualizes the genre um, of the sources as well. So referring to the objective news story um, that uh, was from a student newspaper. So many approaches, um, uh, so getting into the implications, um, many approaches to assessment of student learning, even those that seek to operationalize critical approaches and an equity framework, persist in centering deficiencies of marginalized students as a starting point, um, seeking to bring these learners up to what is perceived as normative. Um, this finding reveals that marginalized students can also be the standard bearers. And I'll refer here to Asao Inoue's quote, to make writing assessment ecology anti-racist, then we must find ways to see, critique, and use the dominant white middle-class discourse of the classroom for the benefit of all students in the classroom, which means it cannot be the standard against which all are measured. So our study revealed an area of high achievement for traditionally marginalized students. And while the use of the trust indicators could arguably fall into the category of white middle class discourse, our findings suggest research based orientations to assessment may reveal um, inadequacies in deficit theorizing. Key finding number two, uh, interviews as sites of meaning making. We found instances of meaning making both for us as interviewers as well as for the interviewee. And just by way of example, uh, we'll take a look at two um, snippets um, that demonstrate this. Um, and in particular for us as interviewers, um, the revealing of contact zones and autoethnography. Um, and for the interviewee, uh, we observed many instances of metacognition or uh, learning about learning. In terms of contact zones and autoethnography, uh, this uh, snippet from one of the interviews um, demonstrates the student um, describing a contact zone moment um, as they uh, interact with something that they recognize as racist and essentially mimicking, um, mimicking uh, their own culture. And they say, oh my God, this is so rude in response to the source. Um, and then they contextualize um, this within the meaning of this food during, during within their own family. And then Finally, they go on to um, situate this within the alternative narrative of, um, of uh, their own family. Oh, sorry, repeated that part. Um, and then they explicitly engage in transculturalism. Um, so they uh, said, and I was looking for sources that kind of offended me because I was like, this shows the cultural difference between American and Vietnamese cultures. So you can see the student um, 
selecting dominant discourse and then using those to present uh, a different narrative about, uh, about Durian. And as researchers, this is an example of how interviews acted as sites of meaning making for us. Importantly, our interviews did not explicitly ask about issues of race and rep representation, and yet these themes arose again and again. It was through the collaborative process of the interview that we were able to identify this, the concept of defending own culture um, and to view the student experience in these contact zones and the resulting engagement with autoethnography as a way to address these conflicts. For interviewees, uh, we can see um, metacognition as an example of meaning making. And this interviewee described coming up against their own perspective and grappling with other viewpoints. They were a self-described, um, scientifically oriented and pro-GMO in the sense that they do not believe in a scientific basis for believing genetically modified foods are harmful. Um, but we can see in this clip um, a sort of a conflict and a questioning of their own position. So they begin by describing how they would roll their eyes at um, anti-GMO literature. Um, but then I would also look at people who would be like super for GMOs, and I mean myself included. But there are general, genuine relevant concerns about GMOs, so I don't know like how I got there. And then the student goes on to really succinctly describe how they got there. And they share, it's so much easier to view the world in binary, but everything is just complex and there are gray areas and it's probably not like good or evil. There's a lot to consider, but just in debates and in our difficult or sad little monkey brains that have a hard time accepting the complexity, it's just so much easier to view the world in black and white. They go on to say, you have to look hard for good sources or spend time really reading and then thinking about what you write, which is kind of the point, which is that complex stand, uh, which is that complex stand is where you get to in your paper. So in this, you can see this arc of um, questioning, recognizing divergent viewpoints, and then being able to um, bring together those alternate viewpoints into greater understanding. Our second key finding, uh, or sorry, the implications of our second key finding um, in terms of interviews being sites of meaning, make, meaning making. And I'll share another quote from Asao Inoue, um, which is normalized whiteness contributes to white supremacy in language practices in the academy and society um, and produces racism. It colonizes. And of course, normalized whiteness is not referring to the skin color of teachers or students. Whiteness in this context refers to the set of structures in our reading and judging practices. So the better question is, how can we understand and address white supremacy in classroom writing ass assessments with students? So there's sort of two components to this quote. Um, the first is we're all implicated in this. We're all part of the academy. We've been conditioned by the academy. Um, and the second part is we really need modes of breaking out of this orientation, modes of breaking out the, of the inherently um, biased and white supremacist structures that we work within. So alternative assessment methods, and in this case, interviews and grounded theory methodologies, provide opportunities for educators and students to mutually in, uh, engage in revealing assets of learning, learners and meaning making that can help us, both students uh, and instructors alike, um, extend beyond or break through um, our orientations. Our third key finding is sort of our big finding, um, which the previous two findings really um, build up to this uh, third and final finding. Um, and that's th that interviews offer opportunities for asset-based anti-racist assessment. 
our findings suggest that alternative assessment approaches, in particular interviews and research-oriented methodologies, can manifest critical and equity-minded assessment practices. Many traditional learning outcomes are deficit-based and normative in nature, um, and interviews provided us a way to move beyond this. And so how do we orient ourselves for critical assessments? Um, the first um, observation we have is uh, embracing the assessment killjoy identity. And um, just to give some context for this, um, drawing on queer theories of failure, Sarah Ahmed defines a feminist killjoy as someone who resists the normative pleasures of happiness, success, and achievement as they're con conventionally defined. Um, not only refusing them themselves, but also creating drag for others by stopping or limiting their ability to enjoy these benefits. Caswell and West Puckett um, adapt Ahmed to theorize the assessment killjoy. And this is one who refuses to abandon commitments to marginalized students or embrace efficient, often corporate ap approaches to assessment. These actions mark critical assessment professionals as killjoys who disrupt the sense of success and achievement felt by others on campus about the assessment practices. Um, killjoys uh, critique and resist, in short. A major critique of interviews is their inefficiency. However, a killjoy perspective rejects the efficiency imperative, uh, valuing the depth of interviews and their ability to turn up novel ideal, ideas and outsider feedback. Um, so essentially, um, leaning into success, systemic injustices in our assessment practices. Interviews also provide an opportunity for us to develop counter stories. Uh, Martinez, 2014, argues for the need for counter story theorizing in terms of critical race theory, um, contrasting narratives of white educators with a conversation between two Chicanas, herself and her mother, to show how counter story can resist deficit narrative about students of color by reframing stories of failure and underpreparedness in terms of intersectional race, class, and gender oppression, um, and highlighting the value, the valuable knowledge and perspective marginalized people bring to academia. So the idea of interviews as meaning making um, really operationalizes um, the idea of counter narratives. Martinez's depiction of counter narratives and the critical race theory she cites emphasizes the dialogic nature of counter story and underscores the value of building counter narratives through conversation, especially that rely on personal narrative and lived experience. Interview techniques that rely on open ended conversation and invite participants to reflect on their experience and make meaning from it can provide opportunities to create these kinds of counter stories. So implications um, for finding number three. Um, alternative as assessment methodologies may have particularly power, powerful implications for the development of learning outcomes uh, that center the assessment of students who are underrepresented in the academy. And learning outcomes are so central to assessment. Um, and just a quote from the NILOA report, if learning outcome statements serve as the point from which educational experiences are designed and the learning outcome statements themselves are not inclusive or include bias, then the educational design will as well. Um, so the opportunity of these counter narratives of the dialogic process of interviews provides a really rich opportunity um, specifically related to um, the development of new learning outcomes that uh, encourage us to think beyond our academic conditioning. For example, the theme of defending own culture that we identified in our study could be extrapolated to information literacy skills and um, uh, corresponding learning outcomes such as recognizing bias, um, uh, invoking one's power as a producer of information, um, and uh, countering stereotypical uh, narratives. Sorry, I had to see around my screen. Um, 
So uh, the potential of this to really change how we um, think about our development of learning outcomes and assessment itself um, are potentially very powerful. So thank you so much for engaging uh, with our series of videos um, and this study. Uh, we hope that you are able to join us on Wednesday, September 16th at noon CLAPS conference time um, to uh, join us in a discussion. Uh, we hope to move um, to, discussion, uh, to discussion of local practices um, as well as engage with questions that you might have. We have a short survey if you have time to complete it to help you start thinking a bit about your own local context and to use as a launching point for our discussion. All right, thank you again and look forward to seeing on you on Wednesday if you're able to make it.